chimney tops that is way Chimney tops, that is where you will find me. Somewhere over the rainbows, skies are blue. Tatiana and Doug for that wonderful prelude, the melee and the hula. And we may now take off our face masks. I invite you to do so if you're comfortable taking your face mask off. We do ask everybody to remain in your seat throughout the entire service. We've been very intentional about keeping people sitting six feet apart, um, unless you're with your family or social bubble still. And, um, we do ask everyone uh, not only to remain in your seat, but if you have to get up, um, that you would put your face mask back on, fully covering your nose and mouth. And if you might be passing somebody within six feet, give them the chance to do the same as well. 
Well, welcome to church today, to each and every one of you. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu or pastor of Kaloa Union Church. And today is a very special Sunday for several reasons. And I'm gonna get into some of those reasons right away. But first of all, I wanted to point out a few things. Uh, first of all, I know we have some guests with us today. Welcome to our guests that are visiting with us. If we happen to have any guests that are here for the first time, never been here before, we have a packet for you with a gift from the church and also information about the church and a visitor card that you can fill out and give us a little information about yourself as well. And for those of you that haven't been around for quite a few months, uh, just be sure to be aware of our temporary worship guidelines for the pandemic uh, on the top of page five. They actually haven't changed for several months now. But I think it's really important that we all know what uh, we've agreed on together and uh, just make sure that we keep everyone as healthy and as safe as possible. Just realized I dropped something here that's rather important. In just a moment, I'm going to go over that. One of the things that we do not do during the pandemic is pass, pass around an offering plate. And so if you would like to uh, make a donation to the church and offer a gift, if you've been especially blessed by your time together, you may do so after the service by just dropping off a, a gift in the bowl at the communion table. And we also have, I believe, a uh, basket right by the main entryway, by the main doors right outside there. Um, I also hear that there's um, a, another basket or bowl over there with a rainbow sticker for each of you that you can grab as a gift on your way out because today is Open and Affirming Sunday. So um, I'm going to hold off on that part. I was going to jump right into there, but I think we have another announcement that would be uh, more appropriate to do at this moment. And um, I'm going to ask Tiffany Marati if she would come up front here. And Tiffany, if you'll put your face mask on and um, just kind of hold your breath and maybe come down the center aisle or whatever. <laughs> so um, Tiff Tiffany, I'm going to have you stand right in the middle here. And some of you know this already, but last uh, week at our church council meeting, we voted um, to hire Tiffany as our brand new youth director to work with middle school and high school students. So let's give Tiffany a hand. And, and this has been something that we have been working on for a very long time uh, in terms of this whole process. And part of the process has also been putting together a search committee and um, I'm just gonna ask if you're a part of the search committee just to stand where you are. And so I think I see Amber Strong out there in the back. And Joni Ito is standing, I think, over in Moore Hall, watching on the big screen. And, and she's standing over there. Okay, so we've got those two standing. And um, Trudy Shim, unfortunately, couldn't be here uh, this morning. But the four of us were the search committee. And we began meeting months ago looking at profiles and trying to figure out um, the best way to move forward. And it was so clear to us that Tiffany was the person of choice. We really believe God leading us to hire her as our person to work with middle school and high school students beginning this week on July 1st. Um, Tiffany, if you'll just hang out there for a moment, your uncle Doug wanted to come up here and say a few words about how pleased he is with this decision. just a minute, but uh, I just wanted to bring up the fact that my dad and my mom, they, they, they always wanted to someday erect a youth center here at Kaloa Union Church. And this is obviously um, possibly the beginning of, of that happening in the, in the future. And I'm sure her grandpa is smiling that his granddaughter has become the youth director for Kaloa Union Church. So. Thank you, Doug. And congratulations, <laughs> Tiffany. We, we look forward to hearing all about what the plans are and how they unfold and develop. Thank you very much. And now I wanted just to mention um, what Open and Affirming Sunday is. In the United Church of Christ, we have this whole organization that focuses on the importance of welcoming all people, including LGBTQ plus persons. And um, a few years ago, we decided as a church to become an official open and affirming congregation 
in the United Church of Christ. And it was very much a highlight of my ministry to be a part of that. And one of the things that is required by the denomination in order to become an official open and affirming church is to put together an open and affirming covenant, which we did together as a congregation, and then we voted on, and the decision was unanimous. And this was early 2019. Well, today is in the denomination, officially Open and Affirming Sunday, where congregations throughout the United States celebrate the importance and the decisions that the congregations have made throughout the country that are open and affirming, as well as the denomination as a whole of welcoming all people, regardless of who you are, whom you love, what your circumstances are in life. And as we begin our worship service today, I wanted to read to you part of the card that is in here, because this comes right out of our open and affirming covenant. And so pay attention to these words, just so you know what today is all about for us. At Koloa Union Church, we believe that every human being is made in the image of God and loved unconditionally by God. We trust that each person has something of value to offer our church and the broader community. We affirm, welcome, and invite everyone to worship, learn, create community, and serve among us, including persons of every gender identity, sexual orientation, relationship and familial status, immigration status, political party and cause, socioeconomic status, religious background and faith tradition, physical and mental ability, ethnicity, age, and culture. So I would like for you just to sit with those words for a moment and rejoice that you, whoever you are, are welcome into the life of this congregation and so is everyone else. Morning. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm short. Today's call to worship is inspired by Psalm 16. Come, let us worship the Lord with open hearts and open minds, always looking for God in our midst. The Holy One to whom the psalmist proclaimed, I keep the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Let us find great joy in the presence of the Lord. And let us find rest in the Eternal One, to whom the psalmist declared, Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also resides secure. Let us welcome our neighbors into the joy of the Lord, always widening the circle of our fellowship and sharing the love of God to whom the psalmist prayed. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us pray. Holy God, some of us come before you today with hearts filled with joy. Others come with heavy hearts. Some come with broken hearts. Most of us come with hearts that have deeply felt the whole gamut of human emotions. We come before you with them all. Eternal God, May we trust in your infinite wisdom, knowing that we see very little of the big pictures in the universe and understand even less. Increase our faith and give us hope. God of grace and compassion, as we trust in your loving presence in every human life, may we see the world through your eyes as much as we can. And, through we, and though we see through a dirty glass glass dimly, may we be, love our neighbors as ourselves, knowing that this is how we best love you. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 through 18 and 33 through 34. Listen for the word of God. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin, you shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. 
you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Today's New Testament reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, and 13 through 15. Listen for the word of God. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. However, you bite and devour one another. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Today's gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Listen for the word of God. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is the law in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love your God, Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. May God bless the reading of the word and may our hearts be open to receiving it. Hello, hello, hi everyone. <laughs> um, good morning, my name is Chris, this is my wife Michelle, and um, we're gonna be doing a song this morning, and it's one song that I often resonate with when we go through tumultuous times, and I know that we've had quite a few, and it's nice to hear the scriptures to remind us that all of the grace and love in the world have already been given to us by God. And it's important that when we look at others, even those that we may not agree with on, on values, that God loves us and we need to see everyone in the same way. But um, yeah, I picked I, I pick this song for just the reason of like, it's such a crazy time right now for everyone. Twenty-five years and my life is still Trying to get up that great big hill of hope For a destination I realized quickly when I knew I should That this world was made of this brotherhood of man Oh, whatever that means so I cry sometimes when I'm lying in bed Just to get it all out What's in my head And I'm feeling a little peculiar And so I wake in the morning And I step outside And I take a deep breath And I get real high And I scream at the top of my lungs What's going on? And, and I say Hey, 
what's going on and I try oh my god I to try I try all the time but in this institution let that pray oh my god I to pray I pray Sometimes when I'm lying in bed just to get it all out, what's in my head? And I'm feeling a little peculiar. And so I wake in the morning and I step outside and I'll take, take a deep breath. Then I get real high and I scream the top of my lungs, what's going on? And I said, hey. for that beautiful and appropriate song for today. We are actually celebrating several anniversaries this weekend. 65 years ago yesterday, the United Church of Christ was formed. The year was 1957, and it was formed by two separate denominations coming together to form a brand new one. One of those denominations was the Congregational Christian Churches, which was founded in 1931 when various other denominations were looking at what was happening in the world in the 1930s and noticing things like nationalism in Germany, and basically believing that as Christians, we not only need to look at God in our hearts, but ask, our, ask ourselves, what difference might we make in society and in the world? Because when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God or the reign of God, he very clearly talked about making a difference in the world. And so the Council for Social Justice was formed in 1934 as this organization within the denomination looked at things throughout the 1930s and 40s that they said, this is not just. We're forming and figuring out what it means to be this new denomination by looking at issues like Nazism in Germany, but also looking at ourselves and asking what's wrong with how our nation is treating Japanese Americans during World War II and looking at how our policies are affecting farm workers and factory workers negatively. And the list goes on and on. But as this new denomination was forming back in the 30s and asking these questions throughout the 30s and 40s, they kept reaffirming a commitment of independence within congregations to do as they felt so led, and also freedom of conscience within each individual. Well, in 1934, the Evangelical and Reformed Church also formed. So these are two denominations that are kind of forming in separate locations at the same time, but they were both asking similar questions. And one of the defining features of the evangelical and reformed denomination was that they were looking at many different aspects, theologically and otherwise, 
of many different churches. And two of the things they were looking at were those who believed more firmly in the Lutheran theology that came out of Martin Luther in Germany and the more Calvinistic Protestant theology that came out of John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland. And without boring you with any of the details, I'm just gonna say that how Luther looked at church and how John Calvin looked at church, it was very different primarily in how you run the church, who's in charge, and how they do it. But this new denomination in 1934 said, we believe that no matter what we come together thinking is the better way, if we have a Christ-like spirit, we should be able to get along and figure this out together. So it's those two denominations that came together in 1957, 65 years ago yesterday, that formed a brand new denomination called the United Church of Christ that took all that good stuff in terms of both social justice and social action, as well as making sure that every congregation retained its own autonomy and independence and all people from all the churches had freedom of conscience to believe as they so chose at the time and continue to do. Well, also 50 years ago, yesterday, the very first gay man was ordained in the United Church of Christ, half a century ago, and that was historic. Bill Johnson was a student at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley and coming to terms with his sexuality. And even though it had never been done before, he came out as a gay man in seminary. And while he was there for the three or four years working on his Master of Divinity degree, he decided that he was gonna seek ordination in the United Church of Christ as an openly gay man, and that had never been done before. But there was a gathering in Berkeley at the time in the Graduate Theological Union where an or, a new organization said, we need to talk about sexuality. And our, our first meeting together is gonna be about sexuality and the Bible. Over 400 people showed up in Berkeley. And it was at that meeting that Bill Johnson announced that he would be seeking ordination in the Golden Gate Association of the United Church of Christ in the Northern California Nevada Conference. 50 years ago yesterday, he was ordained in the United Church of Christ in San Carlos, California on the San Francisco Peninsula. And that same year, he formed the organization that is now known as the Open and Affirming Coalition. Thanks to Bill Johnson, there are people like me and hundreds, if not thousands of others, that know that there's a place in the United Church of Christ to show up as we are and not have to hide any part of ourselves. That was historic at the time, not only because it was a first for the United Church of Christ, that was a first for any mainline Protestant denomination in the country. I should also say that we're celebrating this year the 40th anniversary of Anne Holmes, who was the first lesbian to be ordained in the United Church of Christ. So Anne was at Vanderbilt Seminary in Nashville, and she knew about Bill Johnson and said, you know, it's time for me as a lesbian to do what Bill Johnson did as a gay man 10 years earlier. And she had recommendations from some of her colleagues and mentors just saying, it's gonna be harder for you. And you know, it might just be easier to wait until you're ordained. And she ignored, or she listened to that, the, that advice, but she decided to go for ordination 
openly as a lesbian. And she said something like, to do otherwise just wouldn't be right as a Christian. And I think what she was getting at as I was reading about her this week was this idea of you can't show up to a pulpit as a pastor of a congregation and tell people, God loves you just as you are, and excuse me, now I have to go hide in my closet. The hypocrisy of that. So anyway, today, this week, we celebrate some historic events that have happened in the United Church of Christ that have not only paved the way for so many in our denomination, but since that time, quite a few other denominations like the Presbyterian Church USA and the Episcopal Church in the United States and a handful of others have done the same thing and opened the doors to all people. So we celebrate today what it means to be open and affirming. But we also look at today as an opportunity to ask ourselves, how might we even better love our neighbors? So loving your neighbor, and let me go so far as to say, loving your neighbor as yourself, is something that we Christians point to Jesus as saying. We all know that Jesus said that. Love your neighbor as yourself, as we heard in the gospel reading this morning. This was actually something that was said way before the time of Jesus. Somewhere between 330 to 540 years before Jesus. The experts, the experts tell us that the earliest writing that they have of those words, love your neighbor as yourself, was from the book of Leviticus when it was written during that time frame, some half a millennium before Jesus. However, we also know that orally, according to the oral tradition, those words were proclaimed for at least another thousand years. So we're talking about 3,500 years ago in the Jewish tradition, the Jewish people said, love your neighbor as yourself. We also point to Jesus as his followers as being the one that extended the boundaries of what it meant to be a neighbor. And we see, of course, in the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus was basically saying, the neighbor is the person who's not anything like you at all. It's the immigrant, the foreigner, the person who worships differently than you and believes differently and dresses differently and speaks a different language than you. But again, these words actually come right out of the book of Leviticus, some 3,500 years ago when they were first said, because in Leviticus, we have the words, get this, love the alien as yourself. And what Leviticus was getting into and goes into further is, you were once aliens in Egypt. Treat all of the aliens, all the immigrants, all the foreigners among you as you wished you had been treated by the Egyptians way back then. So again, Jesus didn't come up with this idea that neighbor didn't mean just the people you like. These are, again, the people who were very different from you, from different places, who believed in different things, that worshiped differently, that wore different clothes, that spoke different languages. Love the alien as yourself. These were words that the Jewish people said came right out of the mouth of Moses, their greatest prophet, the, the man they believed that was closest to God. The Jewish people believed that loving the foreigner was part of God's plan for them. 
Now, I don't think I have to tell any of you that the Jewish people have not always been great at loving the foreigners as, as themselves. And I think I also don't have to tell any of you that Christians have not always been great at loving foreigners as ourselves. And furthermore, I don't think I have to say that Americans who claim Christian faith have not always been good at loving immigrants and refugees as ourselves. The point is, people have known for thousands of years that God wants us, that it's important spiritually to love people who are different as ourselves. But we don't often see it happening in history or in our current times. It's hard to put into practice. And yet, that is our calling. That is what God is calling us to do today, just as that is what God is calling or was calling or Jesus was calling people to do 2,000 years ago, just as Moses was calling people to do over 1,000 years before that. Yes, it's hard to love people who are different, people who seem very strange, people whom we might find threatening. But you know, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians, I think is really helpful in terms of understanding our role in this. Paul is sometimes thought of as being very conservative, but I want to tell you, I think Paul was radical for his day. Last week, we talked about the whole book of Galatians, but focused on chapter 3, and I'm not going to go over all the details of what I said last week, but I, I do want you to know that to Paul, gospel, which means good news, meant freedom. And the key verse in all of Galatians are the words, Christ has set us free. And what Paul was getting at was that nobody in any religious organization, including his own, should tell people of different cultures how they should worship God and what rules and regulations they should follow. And last week I told everybody that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and the big problem in the Galatian church at the time was that we had all of these Christians who were Jewish trying to, Jewish, trying to impose their Jewish rituals and rites and traditions on the Gentiles, and Paul just said, stop. I don't care who you are, that's wrong. And he even condemned people from Jerusalem, some of the church leaders that weren't backing him up. To be followers of Jesus, according to Paul, meant that you never get to impose your religious traditions and rituals on other people, including in the church. For Paul, Freedom meant accepting the fact that we are free by the grace of God. In other words, there's nothing that you ought to do or accomplish in order to be free. It's a given by God's grace. And we're free from any ritual that somebody else tells us that we have to prescribe to based on their religion and their background and their culture. But what are we free for? What are we free to do? According to Galatians, according to Paul, as he's writing to the followers of Jesus in Galatia, you and everyone else is free to live a life of abundance in the loving presence of God, everyone, not just the people like you. It was just about four years ago when our church leaders got together at the parsonage where I live, 
And we asked ourselves some really important questions. Where do we believe God is leading us today and in these years ahead of us? And another very important question, how do we imagine getting there? What do we need to do? Because we can say, oh, that's where God's leading us. Isn't that great? But no, as leaders of the church, as leaders of this congregation, we basically said, what do we need to commit to? And there were two things that stood out from that meeting four years ago. One is, and it was the first thing that came out of somebody's mouth, we need to be open and affirming officially. We've talked for years about how we already are open and affirming and we feel open and affirming and we don't want anyone to not show up because of who they are, but we've never actually gone through the process. It's time for us to do that. And so when we voted at the end of that retreat on what the number one priority should be for this church, it was to become open and affirming. And within a year, by March 2019, this church went through the process, came up with the open and affirming covenant, and voted unanimously to officially be an open and affirming church in the United Church of Christ. I want you to know that since that time, I've had at least three other churches or pastors or church leaders approach me and ask me what it takes because they like the fact that we are open and affirming and they would love for their church to be open and affirming as well. We still have a lot of work to do in that area within the church, but I want you to know just how very pleased I am that this church not only saw that as part of our calling, but also committed to making it happen as quickly as possible. I've heard from people that we are one of the churches that went through the process quicker than almost any other church. It was like we already knew that's what we needed to be. What's it gonna take to do that? And so we did. And I can't tell you how many people and how often I hear, I know about your church because you're the church that welcomes everybody. Or I came to your church because I knew that this is one place that I would not be judged for who I am, that I'm welcome here. So we became open and affirming within, I would say, six to eight months after deciding that's what we wanted to do. And it took a lot of time and effort putting together the open and affirming core team and contacting the denominational headquarters and saying, what are all the steps we need to do? What do we need to read? What's the process? And um, we just did it so quickly and we had a great team that did it and a great congregation that asked many questions, that came to Bible studies, that showed up and said, this is what I want. The other thing that happened at that meeting four years ago our leaders said, you know, we've been talking for years about the importance of the teenagers in our church and in our community. We've been talking about the importance of youth ministry, but it's been really hard for us to get some momentum. Yes, we have a small handful of kids, and yes, we have a few opportunities for them, but we don't have an active and a live program like many other churches, either on the island or in other places. And one thing we realized that all of the youth programs in churches that we knew of were pretty conservative, fundamentalist, evangelical, whatever you wanna call them, where if a gay person showed up, an LGBTQ plus person, they would be told, you're sinful, you're not loved for who you are, you need to change who you are. And as a, as, a, as a group of church leaders, we said, we want to provide something in our church, even if we're the only one on the island, where any middle school or high school kid can come, just like any adult or any child, can come and know that they are loved, not only by God, but by the rest of us, just as they are. Now, you might think, well, why are you just focusing on middle school and high school? And the reason is because 
we already have an active Sunday school program for children, and they're showing up. We already have a bunch of adults showing up, but the one group demographically that just kind of stops showing up to church because they feel like the church doesn't really offer us anything in terms of what we need and what we want, it's, it's the teenagers. It's the middle school and high school kids. It's also college students. But frankly, we said we as a church want to focus these next few years on doing something about it. And so we have been working hard at increasing our stewardship for one thing, but working really hard so that we can actually afford a youth director. And so as you saw at the beginning of the service, Tiffany Marotti is our very first youth director in many, many years, perhaps decades. And it's because of this congregation and your desire to see something like this happening in this church and also your commitment to be very generous. I wanna tell you that four years ago, we couldn't have afforded what we're doing today. And it's because of your commitment to have a vision and move forward in this vision to make this kind of a difference. So I just want to tell you personally, as the pastor of this church, how very pleased I am and how very proud I am of all of you for holding this vision in front of us where all people are affirmed for who they are and asking ourselves the question, how can we be more intentional, especially with the young people, not only that already attend this church, but that live in this community and on the island? I want to thank you for your commitment, and I want to thank you for your prayers, and I want to thank you for whatever it is that you feel God might be calling you to do to assist in the future. Tiffany and I are going to meet um, for the first time, probably on, on Monday of next week, because she starts on July 1st, or, or um, on, on Tuesday of the following week, because I think that would be July 4th, right? The Monday. So anyway, Tiffany and I are gonna meet, and, and one of the things that's foremost in my mind is in many churches, when you hire someone to do the youth program, immediately people take a deep breath, sigh of relief, like, thank God we've got somebody to do all of that now. And I want you to know that in every place I've been, successful youth ministry is where the entire church says, and what might my role be in assisting this? It might be dance, it might be prayer, it might be music, it might be teaching, it might be providing meals for young people. I'm guessing that each and every person that's here today can think of at least one thing that you can do for the upcoming youth ministry in this church. I'm looking forward to it because I believe it's just going to thrive and not only will our young people grow, but more young families and more people will come to this church because of the youth ministry. But it will take an effort on behalf of all of us. And so I want all of you to begin thinking now, what might you do to make sure that this is the most successful youth ministry possible? And let me know what you come up with. Let Tiffany know. Be supportive. And you'll be hearing from her about ways that she knows that she's going to be needing some help. Well, thank you so much for your commitment, for asking questions in terms of where God is leading us and being supportive financially, through your prayers, and also through rolling up your sleeves and just asking constantly, and what can I do? So thank you to each and every one of you, and um, as I look forward to wherever it is God is leading us next, I know that I've got all of your support because that's just who you've always been. Thank you very much. And now it's time for the joys and concerns of the congregation. If we have any cards, this is the time to bring them up. Thank you, Michael. So from Tiffany, prayers for her brother Mark who hurt his shoulder while boogie boarding. 
and also prayers for Carmela, uh, Tiffany's niece, who is feeling under the weather, praying doctors find out what's bothering her. I also just found out my brother Pat has COVID, so please keep Pat in your prayers. Uh, prayers, this is from Suzanne. Um, can't read this, does it say Arme? Amy. Oh, Amy, so prayers for Amy. And then from Bonnie, prayers for Edie Mo, um, who lost her best friend, Reggie, her dog. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then, um, oh, uh, from the church office, Mike and Fran John Shoy, who are church members, celebrated their 70th anniversary. Their family asked church friends to send a card or email congratulating them. See Penny for addresses. So let's see what else do we have here in terms of joys and concerns. I'm just very joyful and grateful for family and my sister Allison and her wife Julie are here with us today and their son Lonnie, Kalani and his family will be joining us for a picnic later on. I'm always joyful to be able to have family when they come and visit. Um, I'm also joyful for my son Polani who called yesterday and said, yep, Monday all looks good. I'm heading to England to meet Isabel and they're going to spend uh, a week in England uh, having their, um, their English wedding reception because of course they had their American one in New York a few weeks back. Um, and then they're going to do kind of a, a little uh, mini honeymoon to the Austrian Alps. So anyway, I'm just joyful for that and ask for prayers for travel and mercies for them, for safety in their travels. And then, of course, um, prayers of joy and thanksgiving for open and affirming for people like Bill Johnson uh, and Ann Holmes, who have led the way for so many of us. And then I ask for prayers for our country and especially prayers for reproductive justice. I know that many of us have very strong feelings about that and we may not all agree on exactly what the path might be forward, but I feel heavy hearts all around me. And um, let us pray for compassion and for wisdom for our leaders. As I was listening to um, Chris and Michelle earlier with that first song about revolution, um, I, I, that word just keeps popping into my head of how the changes that I believe we need to make in our country would require some kind of revolution, hopefully a very peaceful one, of course but there are some major changes that need to happen for us to move forward as a country. And so I would just ask for your prayers that whatever this revolution looks like, because actually it's already begun, that it would be peaceful and that it would be effective and that we would find hope, not only in our own hearts, but in the hearts and actions of people throughout this country and people throughout the world who are being very supportive of people here trying to make a difference. I would invite you to pause for a moment and lift up all the pain that we may be feeling today here in this place and in our country. Offer prayers to God as you feel so led. Give thanks. Pray for what is needed. And after a moment of silent prayers, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we begin by giving you thanks for the many blessings in our lives, especially the blessing of family, of friends, of congregation, the blessings of being together and celebrating time together, blessings of anniversaries and birthdays, blessings of being able to travel again safely with health 
with security and safety and to be able to go to places and visit with people whom we love. And God, we thank you for this church, for the wider church, first of all, the, 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 the church that is not only our denomination, but the worldwide church of Jesus who ought to always be fo focusing on loving our neighbors. We give you thanks for the church and also for our denomination. Thank you for Bill Johnson and Ann Holmes and so many others who've led the way among us so that our church can actually be open and affirming and to let people know that everyone truly is welcome here. Oh God, we pray for justice in our country. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom and compassion for all of our leaders. And God, for leaders who refuse to have neither wisdom or compassion, may we as a country figure out a way to replace them. And God, as we consider the national leadership here in this country as well as in other places, we pray for peace. We think of Ukraine and know that the horrors of war that people there are experiencing, that we hear about on the news every day, we know, oh God, that this is unjust and we pray for peace. We also pray for peace in Afghanistan who has suffered yet another horrible natural disaster this week. God, we know that there are people all over this world who are suffering And so we pray that we, in our country, would be able to put our differences aside and seek justice and put our energy into actually loving our neighbors as ourselves. Oh God, we know that there are people here today who are in pain. We know that there are people who are upset and angry. We know that there's also people here and those among us and those we love who are injured and ill. And so we pray for healing, we pray for health, we pray for comfort. And God, we also know that people among us are suffering in deep grief for those who have recently lost animals and pets, for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for their peace and comfort as well. And God, for us, as we determine together what it means to be the people who follow the teachings and the life of Jesus Christ, may you give us wisdom and compassion so that we may always love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Um, hi again, everyone. This, uh, this song is called Bless the Broken Road, and it's by Rascal Flatt. I set out on a narrow road many years ago, hoping I would find true love along the broken road. But I got lost a time or two, while my brown kept pushing through. I couldn't see how every sound pointed straight to you. A heavy, long lost dream led me to where you are. Others who broke my heart, they were like northern stars, pointing me on my way into your love and arms. This much I know is true that God bless the broken road. about the years I spent just passing through. I'd like to have the time I lost and give it back to you. 
But you just smile and take my hand You've been there, you understand It's all part of the grander plan That's coming true A every long lost dream Led me to where you are Others who broke my heart They were like northern stars Pointing me on my way Into your loving arms This much I know is true That God bless the broken road so much Chris and Michelle for sharing your music and yourselves with us we're very blessed to have you with us and I also just wanted to take a moment to thank Chris personally for his advocacy and very hard work educating and also demonstrating with signs and things like that um, on behalf of raising the minimum wage here in Hawaii which is now the highest in the nation as soon as this law goes into effect and it was on the news again this week but it's, it's people like Chris that have been out there really working hard, letting people know just how important this is, and writing letters and encouraging people like me to write letters to our state um, representatives. And so I celebrate um, this. Seems like a huge, very, it is a very huge jump forward in terms of justice for working people, but also um, I know we have a long ways to go um, for so many people in our communities. So thank you, Chris, and let us all keep up the good work together. It's now time to put our face masks back on as we close our service and our time together. And please make sure that your mask is fully covering your nose and your mouth. And we ask you to keep your face mask on until you're either fully off the property or back in your vehicles. Uh, we are still officially a no-touch congregation, and so rather than shaking hands and hugging and even fist bumps, we invite people to use the, the non-touching forms of greeting and saying goodbye, the hands together, the hand over your heart, even blowing a kiss through your face mask. Thank you so much. And now would you stand for the blessing and benediction. As we go from this place, let us constantly be looking for new ways to love our neighbor and expand what it means to be a neighbor. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. I see trees. Green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. So white, bright blessed days, the dark sacred nights, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow. So pretty in the sky Are also on the faces Of the people passing by I see friends shaking hands 
saying, how do you do? There